Okay, we are in Orchot Tzadikim. Please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, hit notifications wherever they are, and that way you'll be sure to never miss a class. Okay, we are talking about, we're continuing our discussion about hardiness and why it's bad. He says, next, the evil inclination will attempt, will attempt to reveal your piety and good deeds before the populace mm. uh, with the rationalization that in doing so, you may cause them to emulate your deeds. Okay, it's always a good uh, bit of uh, foolishness going on here. I'm going to show you how pious I am, and that way you're going to imitate me. That's my Yetzirah speaking. Okay, This too was drawn from haughtiness, though we do find instances of great men praising themselves, such as in the Gemara Megillah. They did so only before their students and colleagues so they would follow in their ways and emulate their, uh, their deeds. There certainly is a mitzvah in order to, this is certainly a mitzvah, sorry, in order to, that the good deeds become dear to them. And so he says, um, I'll, I'll give you this whole thing here. In number 34, he says, in order that good deeds become dear to them, one of the cases, cited in the above Gemara's Rebbe, asking Rabbi Yeshua ben, Le- Bor- ben Korcha for the reason that the latter merited longevity. In explaining the reason for his request, Rebbe said, it's Torah and I have to learn it. So the Harsha says that the Rebbe assumed that the reason for Rabbi Yeshua ben Karcha's longevity was Torah related. We see then the importance of one's disciples seeing and understanding behavior and actions as relate, that relate to the Torah. Because if, if somebody's living long, and uh, again, the concept is, that Hashem, and he's a good guy, and they're just doing mitzvot, so the concept is that he's being kept alive in order that he can do more mitzvot, and more of the commandments, and as, if you will, a reward for that. You have other people who are wicked, and they live a heck of a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are they living so long? Because there's two, one of two reasons. Well, one of two reasons I'll give you. There's many reasons, but one of two reasons you could pick on is that God is paying him back in this world for all the good deeds he did because there's nobody that does anything bad. It's impossible. You're, doing some, you're fulfilling some mitzvot somewhere. Mm-hmm. Even uh, Asa, uh, who was uh, considered the bad guy of the story, his big mitzvah is keep it up, eh? he, uh, that keep it up anyway, honoring his father. Oh. So oh. that's why he gets to live such a long time. That's why he becomes rich in this world. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. and it's not his Torah knowledge because that didn't yeah. really get him that far. But uh, it's the fact that he fulfilled that mitzvah of honoring the parents. You have others, uh, Og. Og lived to f- over 400 years old, mm. right? Again, he was a killer. Mm. But what, did he, what was his merit? That he saved Lot, ah. right? So he, t- he really did it for alter- the alt. The ulterior motive was that Avram would go, try to rescue Lot, be killed, and then he could, um, Og could marry Sarah. That's what he, his mindset was, but uh, still no, he saved Lot. So as a result of that, he lives, he outlives a lot of people, and is very successful. So Hashem sometimes rewards people for what they do in this world, or it could be that he's waiting for us to do teshuva. He was, he's waiting for us to do repentance. Ah. So he's giving us a lot of lag time. Sooner or later, we're going to realize ah. that we should get in the straight and That's narrow. Interesting. So there's two ways. Yeah. Again, those are two, the two major ways. There's others, but there's two, those are the two major ways you can look at why the bad, the evil, in our minds, the evil lives so long. And, uh, and also, but when you see a, a, a tzaddik living this long, and you, there's a woman I just saw live to 160, is still alive at 116 years old. So everybody wants to know, so how'd you do it? So they'll tell you, well, I smoked every day of my life, <laughs> or I had, uh, I had pork, or whatever they're gonna say. <laughs> or they could say, I never was angry at somebody. Oh. You know, it depends on what they want to pick on after 116 years. Yeah. Assuming they still have their brain, then yeah. uh, you know, if they're still sharp, they can come up with a lot of things, or they can, uh, you know, whatever the case is going to be. But we really do look to these people and say, uh, what do you credit your longevity to? Mm. You know? I'll never forget in Maine, the, the, I saw it was on the t- radio, I mean the TV, that's why I saw it. It was a newscast where the woman is 90s, in the 90s, and they're asking her, 
uh, and she was shoveling. I said, how do you, how do you do that? You don't look like a person 90, you look like a person 60. She said, frozen meat don't rot. <laughs> <laughs> it was very cold where she was. But it's, uh, so, I mean, that was her thing. So, okay. Uh, it was, that, back in just before you read 34, yeah. it said, we find instances of great men praising themselves. They did so only before their students, you know, to try to influence somebody to emulate their way. So is that, in other words, uh, you don't want to go strutting around like a rooster, but uh, in other words, uh, if you're trying to teach somebody so uh, you, you try to emphasize what you're doing that is good and right? Correct, correct. So you always want to do that. But uh, like I said, if, if the way they're presenting it is Rebbe asked a question. In other words, when the people asked a question to the person who's living long, that's when the person has the opportunity, to right? So that's, yeah, that's when the person has the opportunity to do it. Wow. On the wow. other hand, if you're going to say, well, I, I'll give an example. I just read today in, in Halacha, uh, in the Kitsu Shochan Rok. So it says that davening mincha, every, the afternoon service, every day is a great reward. Why? Because it's the hardest one. Yeah. In the morning, I wake up, I have to pray. Fine. That's, that's, I woke up, I have time. I'll have a little bit of time. Comes to nighttime, I also have time. I have a nice, a nice big thing. But when it comes to the daytime, well, I have to work. Most people are working during the daytime. When the sun is up, most people are working. So in the middle of my day, in the middle of my work day, I have to stop and I have to pray to God. That's a big thing. Because, again, you think I have time. I have time. Surely now, with the time going as far as it's going, it's going to be till in this time zone, till 9.15, 9.10. Yeah. 9 10 in the middle of summer is 9 10, 9 15, something like that. I think that's when yeah. uh, sunset is or yeah. a little later. Yeah, something like so, uh, whatever it's going to be, you think, Whoa, I have a long time. Well, every once in a while, you miss it yeah. because you're not thinking it. You think you have time. Yeah. And yeah. the answer is, No, I don't have time. So, so you have to, uh, that's why it says, you got busy and you Right. Them. That's why it says yeah. you have to yeah. talk right away. Yeah. When you can, you have to pray right away. Yeah. But if you, do, uh, and that's why you get such a reward for mincha, mm. okay, for davin mincha. And that's, again, that would be part of this. That if you say, how did you credit it? Well, I never made, sh I made sure I never missed uh, mincha. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I never uh, fell asleep okay. during class. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> I couldn't have, I couldn't have missed it. <laughs> Perfect timing. Perfect good timing. Okay, so uh, now he also brings down his little story of uh, there's a person, Joe Tannenbaum. Do Tannenbaum was, it, it was, he's not here anymore. Yeah. He was a very big person who donated to Jewish causes, especially educational. <clears throat> if you go to uh, many schools and many shivot, you'll see this name, Tannenbaum. Wow. Okay. So he said, years ago I had the privilege of developing, and what was he, by the way? He was a bi bridge, literally, a bridge builder. That was his, uh, oh. how he made his fortune. He made bridges. He, he built bridges. Oh. Right. I guess it was a contract. He got contracted out. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think he personally built the bridge. He may have, <laughs> but he was building bridges. That was his real uh, profession. Mm. Okay. Uh, so years ago, he said, I had the privilege of developing an acquaintance with Mr. Joe Tenenbaum, wanting my children to meet a Balsadak, a person who gives uh, charity of such great stature. We would visit him regularly during the winter months that he spent in Florida. One of those visits, on one of those visits, he confided with me the reason he insisted that his name be prominently displayed on many buildings and campuses that he had dedicated in Jerusalem and other places. He said, I did not do it for my sake, but rather so that my descendants would see it and would learn from what they had to do with their money if they are blessed with wealth. Wow. Wow. Yes, he couldn't guarantee that them, you know, you can't always pass on the business. Mm. So, but if they are blessed, they should see that their father gave a lot of money to the institutions. And believe me, if, again, if you go to Israel or if you go to Canada and, and all around, or Sameach, it's all the name Tenenbaum. It's all over the place. Wow. Wow. And that's why he's doing it. It wasn't because he wanted people to know, it, it, mm -hmm. you know for the rest of the world to, to praise him. They used to call him Uncle Joe. <laughs> Uh, when I went to Yeshiva, they called him Uncle Joe, but it's, uh, okay. But it, like I said, that's, that's what he, uh, that's the cute story that goes with that. Okay, so he said, um, 
But even in the presence of these, one must not rejoice in his heart, saying, this I know or this I do. But in public, it is certainly forbidden to make such revelations. Even if you conduct yourself with humility and stand long in prayer and study Torah regularly, the, in, the evil inclination will entice you to feel haughty, saying, now those who, uh, who see you will consider you important and honor you for your good ways and great benefit will result from this. Since they respect you, they will respect your rebuke and reprimand. All this is vanity, he says. Hmm. For when you do a good deed, do it for the sake of the blessed creator alone. And your reprimand will be accepted by others, even if you do not think so. For the acceptance of a reprimand is not dependent upon your thoughts. Hmm. They have to be receptive. So and now if they if you are an artist, if you do things so that in order that you can show how pious you are, and with that, and then because you're so pious, you think people are going to accept your reprimand when you're doing something wrong, when they're doing something wrong. So the Orchok Sikkim is saying, you're barking up the wrong tree. That's not going to be, because the person has to be receptive to such a situation. So you do it for the sake of God. Don't do it so that you all gain power over other people. That's the wrong reason to be pious, okay? Rather do it because God commanded you that way. And then once you're doing that, if you reprimand somebody, he's going to talk about reprimanding pretty soon, mm -hmm. then, and, and they accept it, fine. That's, uh, that's not on you. That's on God giving them the mm -hmm. ability to listen, okay? And if you have freed yourself of all this, the evil inclination will, once again, will tempt you by saying, since your divine service cannot be perfect, until you have completely removed yourself from haughtiness, you should conceal your good deeds and show the opposite of what you really feel. Mm. Now pray briefly, and when you wish to study something, do so do it so uh, do so private do it privately, so that no one knows except Hashem. Right? If I want to be humble, I so I don't want I don't want people to see it. That's what the Yitzhar is telling us. Mm. And let no good shape be seen in you, but perform your divine service in a lackadaisical manner so that you will not make a name for yourself and lose reward. Do not, again, so you won't lose your reward. That's why he's saying, do it quietly. Because if you do it openly, you're going to lose your reward. That's the Sahara talking to us. Okay? Do not instruct the doing of good, nor warn against the doing of bad. And do not reveal your wisdom, nor teach it to anyone besides yourself. And do not give any indication of your fearing Hashem, nor display any sign, such as to fill in mezuzah, sister. So here, they're telling you, don't even fill the biblical injunctions. That's your meat, so hard. Don't do anything publicly, but all privately. Oh. Rather, conduct oh. yourself like others and go in their ways and mingle with them in eating, drinking, entertaining, and jesting. By the way, again, if you update this with the word jesting, you're going to say, speak Lush and Hara, because that oh. is the... That is the uh, how we test. Uh, that's how we make our mark today, by giving be able to give a uh, fast retort. Yeah. What's it gone? Gossip. Gossip, right? Gossip, knowing all the latest gossip, knowing how to give a good uh, stuch back. I, I don't know you say stuch, so it's a, a good <laughs> zinger back. That's how I guess you say. But that's uh, but all these things who are telling people the latest that's going on. Yeah, so. You think that that's what you should be doing because that's what everybody else is doing. People love speaking gossip. It's the best thing. Best thing since white rice. Or white sliced bread, that's what it's like. That's okay. All this is the working of the evil inclination to ensnare people in his net. And if one follows his course for the sake of the mitzvah, yeah. his loss is a thousand times, a thousand of times greater than his reward. He is like one escaping from a small fire yeah. into a big one. But the right course is to pray at length with concentration, to instruct the doing of good and against the doing of evil, and to do all the good things, both in public and in private. You really can't be split, right? Because we learned that from actually Yaakov and, uh, Yaakov's children, that well, they could not speak to their brother in a two-faced manner, so they didn't like their brother, they couldn't speak to their brother. Was that, and that was a praise to them, that they couldn't be two-faced. So here also, we don't want to be too, what, do something in public and not in private or vice versa. We want to do everything. We want to be consistent. So, and if one is honored and praised because of this, this praise will not detract from his reward. 
and that he was not motivated to act by it, right? Because I'm not doing it because of the reward, I'm doing it because it was Shem told me to. Right, thing you do. Right. right, so now if one honors, if I'm honored for that, fine. If I'm not honored, fine also. It doesn't really matter. Okay, therefore, when you do a good deed, look into yourself and see from where you, from whom you expect reward. If from Hashem, the deed is perfect. If from others, it is not. When doing something, uh, when doing something uh, in public, determine whether you would do it in private in the same manner that you are doing it in public. If the answer is yes, then your deed is perfect. Yeah. Okay, so you said, uh, and again in his, in the gray part, he says, however truly virtuous is the person uh, whose, act, however truly virtuous is the person whose action in private are higher level, or on a higher level than in public. So the Gemara tells us when Rav Yekiba would pray at this, at the, with the congregation, he was concise in his prayers. He was, it wouldn't take so long. But when governing in private, when praying in private, he would begin in one corner and end up in a different corner oh. due to his many kneelings and bowings. Oh. An example of this was told to me by my Rebbe, who heard it from his father, Rav David, the great, uh, the great nephew of the saintly Chafetz Chaim. So Rev David's relationship with the Chafetz Chaim was uh, such that he frequently spent time at the, uh, the Tzadik's home, the righteous person's home. One year, on the night of Tisha B'Av, Rev David accompanied the Chafetz Chaim to the synagogue where Megillah's Eicha Lamentations was recited after Marev, as usual. Although the mood of the Chafetz Chaim as uh, that of others was understandably somber, there was nothing unusual about his demeanor. But what occurred upon returning home that night was incredible. Rav David, then a, a youngster, would sleep near the room where the Chafetz Chaim studied. As he lay in bed that night, he noticed his great uncle, who was at his table studying, peeking over his bed, seemingly wanting to fall asleep. Wondering what the Chafetz Chaim was waiting for, Rav David acted as if he were asleep. Assuming that the boy was sleeping, the Chafetz Chaim suddenly exploded with emotion crying and, and weeping bitterly with a flood of tears, lamenting the destruction of the temple. The degree of anguish that Rav Dava witnessed was so intense, chilling, and shocking that in relating the incident, he expressed, the immediate, uh, he expressed that he immediately felt regret for having seen it at all. Yet Rav Dava said, when he was among others in Shul, the Chops Chaim conducted himself like everyone else. So here... The, while the uh, Orchot Tzadikim is saying that you should be equal publicly as private. So Rabbi Yachnis is arguing that, based upon the story from the Chafetz Chaim, that he, when you're in private, you can do a little more than when you would have to do a public. And he uses this as a proof. Okay. Hmm. Interesting story. Yeah. So all that we have said in the subject of the evil inclination is but a drop hmm. in the ocean in comparison to the care that one must exercise in dealing with it, for in everything, in every act, in every trait, the evil inclination comes to destroy and to ruin. We have merely opened the door to reveal the activities of the evil inclination for the benefit of those who are, who are unacquainted with the beginning of its ways. And the wise man will understand and hasten to remove it from himself, and the clean-handed man will increase strength. Now, what he's not, what uh, the author here is assuming is you haven't read any of the books. Okay, because anybody who's read the other books like we have, so we all know that the evil inclination is very smart. We've had a lot of fun with the, what we call the Yitzhar. We, we've, he's been working very hard for the past couple of millennia, and he's been trying to trick us. We know some of his methodologies, but even though we know, we still get stuck. We still get caught in the web. Okay, that's why when things happen, we become sad or become angry, or whatever the case is going to be. Because we don't want to recognize it's coming from Hashem, and it's all for our best. So that's the Yitzhara always kicking in, saying, oh, this is for your best, really? Blah, blah, blah. And you go on with it. And so, and we are, and the Yitzhara is tailored to us, by the way. Oh. My Yitzhara is not your Yitzhara, and your Yitzhara is not mine. Yours I can defeat, and yours and mine you can defeat. That is, is, is uh, totally yours different. Knows, yours knows what you're going to do. Mine knows what I'm going to do. Right, right. So mine looks at you and says, really? What's your, <laughs> what you, the story you told me, I won't say for the tent, but the story you told me. Your Yetzirah was saying, what's, a, what's one more? What's one more? It's only your Yetzirah, your wife, who, 
future wife, who said, yeah, I'll leave. That was all, Yitzhahara couldn't fight that. Yitzhahara was saying, no, 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 no. You, you said, I mean, you, you fought Yitzhahara, they said, bye-bye, you lost. I would like this one better than you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but that's really what it is. And so when we conquer that, now the Yitzhahara will have to find some other methodology to try to get you, to try to trick you. Okay, that's something else. But for that one particular thing, you won. But it's continual battle. We never, ever totally defeat the Yitzhahara until what we die. Yeah. When we die, so then it goes back and has to do what it has to do. But it gives this report, and it's a, it totally gives this report. But the, until we die, we always have those quote unquote demons. And we have to deal with that. Uh, some, some worse than the others, but you know. But I, and I, the truth is, if you give it, the more you give into it, the larger than life it, it, it grows. So that's something else. If if you uh, if you don't feed it, it it's not it doesn't get as strong. Which again was uh, yeah, I talked about addiction before, and in, in, in another place. But addiction is basically that. If I give into the addict, the more I give yeah, into the yeah, addiction, yeah. the stronger the addiction becomes. And by the way, if I don't if I find myself not getting that high that I got from the first thing, I want to go to something else. Oh. And I'm going to keep going and going and going because I want to recapture that high. Okay, and that's, that's what it is. Opioids, right? You get, it could you get be opioids. You get stuck on these things and yeah. you got to have more and more. But I'm saying, but the, big, yeah. the worst thing is that you, after you build up a tolerance. It's yeah. like drinking. Yeah. 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 You build up a yeah. tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. And so your body wants, it, you'd have to drink more cigarette to get the smoking like cigarettes, that. right? Oh, anything, anything. Yeah. By the way, this also applies to video games. Oh, yeah, internet, gambling, whatever it internet. Yeah, it internet. It also own, applies to the stock to market. Control. It applies to everything. The more yeah, I give yeah, into yeah. it, the more I see yeah. that as lifestyle. So then I never get enough of it. That's why you have news junkies. <laughs> they can't get enough news. They get they're getting something from that. Yeah. By the way, the likes on your uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, your Facebook or 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 your Twitter feeds. <laughs> People they've tested our there's something in us that it's a new form of uh, Yeah, yeah but there's something in there dopamine, something in us that uh, when you get happy dopamine. Oh. dopamine, thank you. Oh. The dopamine oh. when you get the like, your dopamine level goes up. Like you had some candy or something. Wow. It's, and people really get it. And when they don't get it, yes. they get depressed. Yeah. And you're thinking, it's, it's a like. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's somebody liking your... The expectation. Is yeah, but that's what it is. Yeah. So all of these things are addictive. Yeah. It doesn't wow. have to be drugs. Wow. It can be anything. Yeah. Whatever gets, whatever high you're looking for, and that's why people, uh, they jump out of planes. Right, they oh, they, they jump out and, they, and they're sky, waiting sky to skydiving, sky sky and they're waiting to pull the, the the thing until lower, 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 because they they love the rush. Uh, Me personally, I don't want that rush. I have no idea. I don't want. I can't even dive off the big diving board. Forget that. You know, <laughs> but it's but that's what it is. You want that rush, so and you'll do anything to get that that feeling again, and that's the problem. That's the Yates Sahara kicking into saying you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing right now. But of course, if you do it, people think you're such, so good, yeah. so brave, blah, blah, blah. That's what they, I'm saying, that's, uh, that's what we've been learning about the Yitzhahara. Okay, mm -hmm. so pride in the quality of one's wisdom is praiseworthy, as is written, but he who, uh, but let he who praises himself, praise himself for this, being wise and knowing me, and let him aid, uh, let him add praise to the Creator for having granted him knowledge and understanding and good traits for, uh, through which, uh, through the prayer for wisdom, where it says, I, have give, I give thanks to you, God, for having cast my lot among those who sit in the house and study and not among those who are idle. We say this when we're finishing a, uh, a Masechta, uh, a tractate of Gemara, whatever we're finishing. Yeah. We'll say that as part of it. That thank you for letting me sit in amongst the uh, people who are in the house of study instead of mm. people outside, okay, who aren't mm. who aren't studying the Torah. And as it says, how fortunate we are! How good is your portion! How pleasant is our lot! About this it is written, and his heart was uplifted in the ways of Hashem. 
And for every man, for a man should be lofty hearted and proud hearted in the matters of the world to come. He should not be content with what comes his way and not say enough in respect to what he acquires of him. But all of his deeds in this area should be consistent, constantly aspire uh, upwards and he should take himself to task for falling short in the service of Hashem. Such pride is no impediment to humility, but assists it and causes him to rejoice with good qualities in the honor of his friends and be too concerned with their honor. So he says his lack, in number 43, his lack of hardiness allows him the ability to take note of any honor bestowed upon him and to protect that honor. Someone who was preoccupied with his own honor is, is incapable of doing so. So, so he's saying here the arrogance of hardiness is good if it can drive you to uh, serve Hashem more and more and more instead of just saying enough. Okay, again, if I want to make money, there's ne I never will make enough money. <laughs> I just bought a ticket for 400 and whatever, the 88,000, $100 million. And I, as I bought it, I said to the woman, you know, I know it's not the big jackpot, but what the heck, it's a couple of bucks. <laughs> you know? Because we're used to right now a half a billion or more. So, or a billion, I think the last one was a billion, right? So I'm going way low. I mean, uh, I think nobody's going to compete with me for eight point eighty-eight billion, or whatever, <laughs> five million, whatever it is. But, uh, but that's really, you know, what it is. People, other people though, they get attracted to this and they keep buying and buying oh. and buying and buying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no good, but I'm using, but I'm allowed to use my humility, I mean, my arrogance to serve Hashem. So like I said, with money, we'll never have enough. You have a billion, you, are, you have a billion, you want two billion. You have a million, you want two million, you have 20,000, you want 40,000. It's never enough. You can have as much as you want the bank. You're going to say to God, no, uh, just a little more, please. I need a little more of a cushion. If I have a dollar, I want two dollars. It doesn't matter. Okay, when it comes to holy, when it comes to spirituality, that's when I say, I do enough already. No. Well, we all do that. We all say, well, it's enough. And he's saying, no, that's when you have to use your haughtiness, your arrogance to say, I have to do more. I have to serve God better. Again, not because I want people to praise me, but I have to use that hardiness in order to serve God better. That's, that's what he's saying. That's when hardiness in that respect is good. That I always want to spur, more, spur on more, to do more. Okay? Hardiness against the wicked is extremely praiseworthy. Now here again, we're going to get into a very dangerous area. Re rebuking and shaming them. Not humbling oneself before them, instructing them for good and warning them against evil as much as one can. He gives a nice big note to that saying, uh, be careful, I'll, actually it's worth a while to read. He says, rebuking and shaming them, great care must be given with regard to reprimanding and shaming another human being. Aside from the possible gains and losses, which as the author himself mentions in this very paragraph, must be considered in advance any time these measures are used, one must view them as if he is playing with fire. The very same verse that instructs us to rebuke others, namely, you shall reprove your fellow, warns us not to sin in the process when it says, and do not bear sin because of him, by causing him public shame. The Chafetz Chaim is known to have said that the mitzvah of Tochacha, a, a reprimand to reprimand a sinner is a mitzvah like other mitzvot. Mm. Just as fulfilling the mitzvah of donning to fill in requires thought, concentration, and poor intent, so too, when reprimanding others, thought, concentration, and pure intent are essential. One must always bear in mind the words of the Gemara. The Talmud says, "Hamal ben lo that one who causes public shame to his fellow in uh, loses his portion in the world to come. Obviously, there are times when reprimand and shame may be the only course to take, yet the counsel of Torah authority should be pursued before action is taken. So, like I said, whenever you want to tell somebody off, check your reasons at the door. If you're doing it for any other reason than uh, for the sake of God, uh, then you're, you should not rebuke. We're not talking about children, by the way. We're talking about people. People that you're not responsible for, per se. Okay, your children, and even your children, you can't rebuke to such a point that they're going to rebel against you. You have to, you have to do all these rebukes with brains. 
So you can't get angry at your kids. You can't do all this. You have to really check your emotions and figure out how you're going to do it. Easier, much easier said than done. Let's all face it. We uh, all fall into these things. And we, we could get angry at our kids. We could do all these things. We could rebuke them. We could embarrass them. And it's not good. It's just not good. It's very damaging to the situation. And it won't get what you want. What you really want is, like anything, you want the person to stop doing what they're doing. And you, don't, and you want to be to con, you don't want them to do it even if you're not there. Right? That's the point of the reprimand. If it is, if you, I'm just going to stop the action while you're in front of me. But when you leave, when I leave, you go back to it, I haven't accomplished anything. I accomplished that. I stopped it for five seconds, but that's all I've accomplished. That's why when a teacher leaves the room, I always loved doing this when I was a teacher. I would leave the room and I would tell, and there would be a, the poor substitute who would have to come in because I had a meeting. And I would say to the kids, I expect you to teach her and treat her better than you treat me. <laughs> Please do. I don't want to come back and hear anything bad about you guys. Because <laughs> uh, that was a real crazy class. A class. And um, sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes I got a thing like, wow, you have a great class. I said, thank you. I would just say thank you. I wouldn't say, my class now. <laughs> but uh, I said, I would say thank you. Other times they said, I don't know how you put up with it. I said, okay, I guess they acted like they do with me. <laughs> but uh, really, that's, that's what it is. You want, you want them to be respectful regardless of whether you're there or not. You want to do what's, what's proper, whether you're, there or not, whether you're there or not. And that takes a lot of checking your emotions at the door to say, why am I about to do what I'm going to do? It really does. And some of us are good at it. Some of us aren't as good as others, and some of us stink at it. So it all depends on what's going on. But again, he's trying to warn you to say, be careful. Okay, uh, he said, though this may seem like rulership and hardening in the eyes of the world, such uh, since it is being done for the sake of heaven, it is praiseworthy. One must not humble himself before the wicked, as Mordechai did not humble himself before Haman. And when, uh, whenever he has a mitzvah to do, he must not humble himself at all before them to, to forsake the good because of his subservience to them. And it requires wisdom to know when to do a mitzvah in front of wicked people, or for some, or, or, uh, for sometimes it is better to avoid a confrontation. If someone is arrogant to them in respect to one mitzvah, he may lose a hundred as a result. Regarding this, Loma Mello said, "Do not answer a fool according to his foolishness, and answer a fool And then he also says, "Answer a fool according to his foolishness." They are both wicked and foolish. Okay, so uh, the one who says, "Answer a fool according to his foolishness," he's he's wicked and foolish too. In other words, you don't answer somebody. If you, you avoid the situation if somebody's going to start picking on you, which is why when it comes, uh, you, you like to do a lot with the atheists. Uh, well, you like to answer. And, but the bottom line is, you're wasting your breath. You're wasting your breath. You're wasting your time, your breath, and they're not going to change anyway. There's no argument you can say yeah. to an atheist that's going to change them. Because yeah. it's, it's not in their vested interest. If a person's open, open-minded, open either way, by the way, either way, you could uh, talk to them. But otherwise, there's no, nowhere to go. I only remember one time somebody told me they don't believe in God because they couldn't explain free will. And I was in college, and I was a young upstart. So um, <laughs> what do I care? I, I had five minutes to waste, so I, I wasted the five minutes. And I told them I can prove free will to you. No problem. So I said, oh, yeah, you can prove it. I said, yeah, I put your hands up like this. I said, if it goes like this, it means uh, you get life. goes like this, it means you get death. Right? That's what it is. I said, okay, you got that? You got the rules? This way, life. This way, death. Right? You got it good. And I pushed his hand down to the, uh, to the life. I said, did you have free will or didn't you? Could you put it anyway? He said, yeah, I could have. But, I, but you stopped me. I said, yeah, but you still have free will, right? That's free will. I, ha- I have to go to class now. And I walked away from that. Okay? <laughs> I, I, I feel, why not have fun with this? <laughs> He saw me three months later on campus. I, I wasn't running in a circle. He saw me three months later, and he said, because of you, I believe in God. Whoa. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and what, what? What are you talking about? He said, the argument you gave me, and, I, and he happened to be Jewish. She said, therefore, I'm going to bring my kids up uh, Jewish. I walk and be Orthodox, but uh, I think I'm going to be Jewish. 
Wow. I said, wow, that's really impressive. I was thinking, <laughs> you have no brain. Okay. <laughs> but nonetheless, I hope the kids, uh, I hope he's watching and has, I hope he has Jewish kids. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> it, the point is he was open-minded. His, I'm an atheist sort of thing was a, was a farce. Yeah. He wasn't really an atheist. He wasn't a dyed in the wool atheist because nobody's going to be convinced ah, ah. without simple arguments. Yeah, yeah. Not an atheist. And somebody else who wants to, is exploring. Yeah, I can convince you with that sort of an argument. And then they'll come back to me later on. He never came back to me after that. So I don't know. But it was, uh, I thought it was funny when he tells me three months later, now I believe in God. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't get him to come to me. <laughs> I doubt he didn't believe that much. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm just saying, that's what you, so you have, to, you have to choose who you're going to fight with. And that's why he says, you answer a fool according to his foolishness makes you the fool. Because you're, you're going down to where he is. You're buying his or her um, assumptions. Why should I buy that? I don't buy the assumption. Huh. So it's not worth arguing, which is why, again, you t for the most part, you're staying away from all these arguments. That's why I don't argue, for the most part, with my reform and conservative huh. colleagues. I won't argue with them about it. Because they have theirs, I have mine. I'll argue with other people who don't have a specific uh, opinion about it, where everybody's thinking we're all equal, it's just that you're more lenient than me. I'll, I'll have the discussion. But it's not, no, but the, the colleagues, no, it's not worth it. Because you made your minds up. I made my mind up, you made your mind up. Respect everybody. Have a good day. I'm not going to argue with you about it. Because I'm not going to get anywhere. You won't get anywhere with me, and I'm not going to get anywhere with you. Okay, so... Again, I, I, that's what you have to do. You have to figure out what's going on. That's what he's saying. So he says, therefore, the wise men must take into consideration the time and circumstances and arrange his actions accordingly. For there are things that which he must abandon because of the wicked uh, and, which, and things under which, which he must under no circumstances abandon because of them and for whose sake he must stand up against them with his physical being and with his possessions and not humble himself before them. After the, all the supplies to the realm of mitzvot, but in the realm of business dealings, he should humble himself before them and conduct himself with them beyond the letter of the law in all things. This is a great mitzvah because what you're doing is you're showing them uh, the, the, uh, how a, a, a religious Jew operates in business. So there you want to be a little def deferential, blah, blah, blah. You want to show them uh, that you're basically, again, I don't know how to translate mensch, but you should be a mensch, a, a, gen a gentleman. An about upright it. person. Yeah. Upright person, right. So you want to go beyond the call of duty sometimes in order that they don't say, oh, that's what a pious person does. He rips me off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you want to push yourself a little more for that because mm -hmm. that's what people, un again, people understand money. So if you are upright in business and you just say this is what it is and you even go a little further than you need to, so that is a much greater uh, reflection of what Torah is about mm -hmm. than to just uh, be a stickler for every, oh. for every single thing that's going on. Okay? Mm -hmm. So one who has a trade, I'm not saying be ripped off, by the way. I'm not suggesting yeah, to be right, ripped yeah, off, yeah, yeah. but again, you have to be upright with your business dealings. But in other words, if, they, if there's room to give the benefit of the doubt, legitimately, you give them right. the benefit of the doubt. As a matter of fact, uh, your son-in-law ran into the problem when uh, he had a, a case. So something, it was, it could, it could have gone either way. And so, you know, he, I don't think he fought it as a result. Mm. I think he just said, whatever happens, you know, because it can go either way. So when it can go either way, so now I can't prove it one another. So now you, you, say, you say to Hillam, you say Psalms, and you let it fall by God. I mean, whatever God's going to do, you have to accept that. Mm -hmm. But one is clear black and white, so that's not another case too. But I remember he told me some sort of case with that, mm -hmm. but uh, where he wasn't, he could have gone either way. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, he says, and one who has uh, the trait of hardiness must exert himself and retract from it, for it is a bad uh, defect. And he says, uh, this implies that the process of teshuva is necessary, not only for the act of sinning, but also for harboring uh, bad traits, as the Rambam says. Just as one is required to repent from the act of thievery and immorality, so too must he examine his traits and repent from character traits such as flaw, uh, such as 
uh, anger, hatred, and envy. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he says, uh, its potential harm is great and ever-present, and its potential benefit is very slight. Mm -hmm. Therefore, one must greatly distance himself from foolhardiness, brings one to destruction. As is written, the hardiness goes before destruction. That's in Proverbs. And it also brings him to lowliness. As it said, a man's hardiness will lower him. And he, uh, we are all well aware of what happened to Pharaoh. Because he said, who is God that I shall listen to his voice? And he fell. And Goliath, the Philistine, who said, I have disgraced the armies of Israel. And what happened? He's taken down by a shepherd. Uh, 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 David, who does have, he has no armor on, and with a stone, a sling and a stone, that's all he comes. You have a great warrior who dies to this. Come on, you've just been embarrassed, boy. <laughs> okay? <laughs> to Sancherev, who said, Who among the gods of all these lands rescued their lands from my hand? And what happened to him? He, uh, God struck 185,000 of the people. Uh, and he, Sancher, was killed by his own sons. And then uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who said, Who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? And what happened to him? He turns, he, he's driven from mankind to dwell like the beast of a field and eat the grass. So again, all these people challenged God and it didn't work out for them. Okay. So uh, and that's all because of the arrogance. And all of those and all of the others who spoke the same way and whose end was shame and disgrace who possesses, one, so one who possesses this trait uh, uh, is not rescued from sin and transgression. As Shlomo, King Solomon said, the proud scorner is called the mocker. He acts in the fury of malice. Okay, uh, since we have come this, thus far in speaking of haughtiness, listen to the words of one of the wise. Uh, one sage said, Who is he from whom worry will never depart? One who seeks a statue, stature that is above him. And one who holds himself a knower, that is, one who regards himself as a wise sage, is considered a fool by others. And next, and also next to haughtiness, are bad deeds. And one whose deeds are bad is always hated by others, and people will turn, will turn away from him. And one sage, one sage said, just as pleasantness of countenance is the light of the body, so pleasantness of character traits is the light of the soul. And he further said, it is not dignified for the king to lord himself over other men, so much, so how much more so for a man over another man. And a certain king was sitting on the throne, and before him were placed three, three chairs, one higher than the other, for seating by rank. Three nobles came before him and seated themselves one higher than the other, whereupon the king said to them, How did you dare seat yourselves in this way without my permission? I can tell you where to sit. You ever, if you ever go to a, if you, when you go to dinner, what does the what is your hostess or the host say? Actually, usually the hostess, she'll tell you, okay, you sit here, you sit here, you can choose here and here, but she'll give you the seating arrangements. You don't sit down until the woman of the house tells you where to sit. Right? That's the normal thing. The husband just waits for the woman to tell where she's at, okay? But as I've, I've never really seen the husband, and all places I've gone, I've never really seen the husband say, okay, you sit there. I've never seen that. Maybe it happens, I don't know. I'm guessing it does today. But for the most part, we, we defer to our wife for that. So she, uh, she is the queen of the house. She tells where to sit. If you sit down without waiting for her to tell you, well, the odds are you may have to get up again. I don't know, but it's just not a good situation. So here the king said, how dare you sit down without my permission? So the highest one, the one who went to the highest one said, my family's distinguished background sat me above my fellows. The second one answered, I went uh, above the one because of my great wisdom. The third one answered, the lowliness of my soul and the downtroddenness of my heart set me, sat me beneath them. Whereupon the king raised him up and exalted him above the other two. In this respect, it is written, "For it is better that it be, uh, for it is better that it be said to you, come up here, than you be lowered before the prince." Ah. We'll have to stop there. Okay. You know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, going and uh, visualizing the th three chairs.